Okay, good morning, everybody. What I thought I'd do instead of uh, just posting on a PowerPoint, I thought I'd just take you through a couple of the points of chromatography because um, usually it's a, a required practical that we'll do in the lesson. We do a caboodle sheet, we answer a bunch of questions, all that kind of stuff. But because that isn't possible, and there are parts of a method that you need to know, I'm actually going to take you through this um, PowerPoint. I'll, I'll be talking about additional things as well that you won't get just by looking at the PowerPoint. So I encourage um, everyone to just see this video to the end. It should only be about 15, 20 minutes. It's not a massive section. Okay, so I'll, I'll keep it short, I'll keep it brief. Um, we're gonna look at a few things. We're gonna look at what chromatography is used for and how it works. And then something called a chromatogram, how to interpret them and how to calculate something called an RF value. And for, for, for most of this, I'd imagine that you've already looked at it in some form. Now, um, one of the things that um, you do in primary school before you even come to secondary school is doing splodges of ink and chromatography paper and seeing what the ink separates out into. Obviously, it's a very basic form that involves no science whatsoever. It's just separating stuff out because it looks pretty. Um, but as GCSE uh, and even A-level, um, if you're doing something involving science at A-level or college, chromatography is a really useful tool uh, and it's used quite often, okay? Um, let's use that. Okay, so um, chromatography is used to separate a mixture. Um, that bit in the red box there saying identify what's in a mixture, it is the bit that sort of most, I want to say companies, businesses, jobs that use chromatography use it for, okay? So um, obviously I'm thinking about forensic science. If... Uh, a forensic analyst, uh, um, a forensic uh, analyst, is trying to identify a compound or a substance or a colour of paint or something that's unknown. They will use chromatography to identify it against some known substances. And that very, very blurry picture, sort of centre right, is something that hopefully you've seen before. So we've got uh, a beaker. It's filled with a solvent. Um, most of the time, it's water. But if the dot doesn't dissolve in water then it has to be some kind of ethanol or some kind of alcohol solvent that it does dissolve in. Bits that you won't have gone over before will be these two phases so you've got a mobile phase and a stationary phase and it is pretty much how it sounds it's a mobile phase is a phase that moves and a stationary phase is a phase that stays where it is so in this case the stationary phase is the paper because the paper isn't going anywhere the mobile phase is that solvent, which could be water, don't know. Um, but that mobile phase is moving up the paper. It's moving up the stationary phase. If we're not doing something with uh, ink, in, in forensics, we look at certain proteins and amino acids. Um, I think we even do it in, in A-level biology. Um, you need to use some kind of uh, chemical um, locating agent one that we use is called linhydrin. It's sprayed on and it turns things purple. It basically shows them up. Um, problems with it is that it's toxic. If you use ninhydrin in A-level, if you stay at Miton, then you have to use ninhydrin in a fume cupboard that's on. Um, the fume cupboard hood needs to be down. You can't get anywhere near it because it is a really toxic substance while it's being sprayed, while it's in liquid form in the air, you cannot breathe it in. When it's dry, it's fine, um, but it's a really nasty substance. So this mobile phase and stationary phase, the way they interact with each other and the way they interact with the substance that you're trying to identify um, is really important. So you'll notice, if I've still got my laser pointer finger on, um, that some inks travel further up the paper while some are left behind. Okay, and that isn't that it's being dragged up and left as it goes. Um, it means that it is all moving at a different rate. So the ink up the top here has a really, really strong force of attraction to the mobile phase, to the solvent. So as the mobile phase moves up the paper, so does the ink, because they're really, really strongly bonded. Okay, it's, it's only attraction. It's not a, a bond. It's a... Uh, it's, it's a force of attraction, it's an interaction. Um, the ink down the bottom here has very, very, very weak 
um, force of attraction to the mobile phase. Instead, it has a strong force of attraction to the stationary phase, i.e. it has a strong force of attraction to the paper. And it doesn't matter if the water is moving up, that ink is, has an attractive force to the paper. It won't budge. So what we get, what starts off as a, as a spot of ink, um, we get some dragged up the paper with a high force of attraction to the mobile phase and some stay down the bottom as a high force of attraction to the stationary phase. One of two ways. Okay. The reason this is important that we're going to talk about a little bit later is the way that the ink moves and how far it moves compared to this solvent. This is a solvent front that we'll label in a second. How far it moves up compared to the solvent front can help you identify what compound it is. So a compound that follows it nearly to the top will have a specific value that we'll be able to work out in a bit. And we can look it up in a, in a data book that somebody's spent their time working it out and writing it all down to, to find out what the compound actually is. And some things will have a lower um, data point, so a lower value. So this is time for me to have a really bad drawing. And let's just use some black ink. So we already know the sort of setup that we've got for chromatography. You've got a beaker of some sort or a, a gas tube, something. And inside that, we put some chromatography paper. Okay, so beaker, I have to excuse my writing. Um, a beaker, we've got, I'll just put chromatography paper. And in the bottom, we have our solvent, which can be water or it can be ethanol or a, a type of alcohol, anything. Um, and the amount of solvent you put in is very important. There only needs to be a little amount in the very bottom. And Above it, we need to draw a pencil line. This is the um, this is the method for doing it as well, by the way, guys. So there's going to be a, a question at the very end that asks you to write out a method. So basically what I'm talking about. Um, you've got a pencil line. It has to be pencil because if it was pen, it would run. Okay? It has to be a pencil line. Uh, pencil doesn't um, run when you dip it into the solvent. Basically, it stays where it is. And it's really important because this is our start line. And we use it for some measurements a bit later. Okay. On that pencil line, we're going to put a dot of whatever it is. Very much of a dot. Um, a dot of whatever it is that you want to identify. And you've got to make it a decent sized dot, but it doesn't have to be massive. Just making sure I can draw. There we go. Um, we're going to draw a dot on the line. Okay. And when you dip it into the solvent, what's going to happen? The water is going to start moving up as the mobile phase, or I should say the solvent is going to start moving up as the mobile phase. And hopefully, if it has an attraction to the mobile phase, this ink dot, or this unknown substance, shall we say, will start to move with it. Okay. Then you just leave it. It's quite an easy practical. All the setup is before and a bit of analysis afterwards. So we just leave this. Um, if we're leaving it for an extended period of time, what we might do is we might put a lid over the top to stop things from evaporating. So we're left with the solvent. But we're going to allow this to run right up until the solvent gets nearly to the top. Okay, very, very nearly to the top. Probably... Um, about three quarters of the way up because it will continue by capillary action. It will continue to move up afterwards. If your solvent front runs to this line here, um, then your practical is void. You have to do it again. Okay. So you can't let it go to the very top of the paper. I'll explain why that's important in a minute. Okay. This is called the solvent front. This is called the solvent front. Okay. So this is our setup. We have a beaker with some chromatography paper. Get my 
laser pointer, we've got a beaker and we've got some chromatography paper. We draw a line in pencil to indicate the start point. We put our dot of um, our unknown substance on that line. When we dip it into the solvent, we've got to make sure that the solvent stays below that line. So this solvent here is below the pencil line. Okay? Because it's below the pencil line, the water or the solvent is going to move up past the point and take it with it. It's going to carry it up. If the solvent is above the line, then there's nothing, there's no reason why this, um, there's no reason why this ink or this unknown substance will move up. Okay? So if the solvent is above it, it's just going to dissolve, it's going to diffuse into the, into the solvent, it's not going to work. Okay, so this solvent front has to be below. Now, why is this important? I hear you ask eagerly, anticipating. Um, we've got two readings that we can make from this. First of all, let's put our, so let's just say, this is how high the solvent has moved. Let's move, remove all of these. This is how high the solvents moved okay and there's two values that we need to record the first value is the distance between the start line and the solvent front uh, it could be in millimeters could be in centimeters doesn't really matter uh, the second reading is the distance that the unknown substance moved okay and i would always take the reading at the very top of that line I would always take the reading at the very top of that line, okay? Because that tells us exactly how far it's gone. Okay. The reason this is important is that we need to work out a value. It's like a ratio of how far it's moved up. Obviously, if the dot was all the way up the top here, its ratio would be one because it would move exactly the same amount as the solvent front. So it would be a ratio of one. If it didn't move at all and it had a very, very high force of attraction to the stationary phase, then it would have a value of zero because it hasn't moved at all. You know, halfway would have a value of 0 0.5, etc. So this is going to be a value of about, I don't know, 0 0.65, 0 0.7, something like that. To say that it's moved about 65% of the solvent. Okay, so let's just have a look at a different um, setup. So this is something you might get in a, in a question paper. Um, not that you guys are going to do the exam, but if you're going to do the exam next year, this is what you might see. Okay, We see our paper. We see our pencil line. It has to be a pencil line. That pencil line is above the solvent. It's not below it. It is above it. And we have our spot of our mixture on here is M. Uh, there's a watch glass for this one for its lid to stop the uh, solvent from evaporating. And that's going to be allowed to run all the way up to about here. And then it will be stopped. Right. It's important that you use a pencil after you've finished to draw those lines on because as soon as that solvent has dried, you've then lost how far. It's easy to see while it's damp. It's not very easy to see when it's dry. So you draw your line on for where the uh, solvent front is. You can draw your line on for how far the, solvent, uh, how far the unknown substance moved. So why is it important? In terms of identifying unknown compounds, what we can do is we can take some known compounds. So the known compounds here are B and C, and we can test them alongside our unknown. So we go, you know, what is in A? We don't know what's in A. Anything that's on the same line is the same substance. Okay, so this bit in red at the side here, Substance A is a mixture of three compounds, including substance B, substance C, and something else, this one, that is unknown. We don't know what that is. We know what B is, we know what C is, and they're on the same level, so they must be the same compound. That's just visually interpreting a chromatogram. So this whole thing is called the chromatogram. Uh, it's the chromatography paper after you finish with it. That's just looking at something and going, yeah, they're sort of the same. But what if you want it to be a bit more technical, a bit more numerical? What you do 
is you record something called an RF value. Okay, and an RF value is just the distance moved by the substance, i.e. A, divided by the distance moved by the solvent, which is this solvent front. So if I draw a line, so that's the distance moved by the substance. And this is the distance moved by the solvent. OK. In this case, we've got an RF value of A. Distance moved by substance is 8 divided by distance moved by solvent is 12 and it equals 0 0.67. OK, there is no unit at all because this is a ratio. This is a almost like a comparison between the solvent front and the substance. There is no unit for it. Okay, as long as these are the same, you just divide them. Okay, they have to be the same, and that could be millimeters, it could be meters, it's most likely going to be centimeters because who wants to do a chromatogram that's that big? Um, solvent might not even move high, so it's normally in centimeters. So B has moved three centimeters. So to work out the RF value of B, you need to do the distance moved by the substance divided by the distance moved by the solvent. Okay, and if you wanted to pause the video right now, just quickly work it out. Um, I'm going to put the answer, I'm going to try and write the answer in as neatly as I possibly can um, to see if you got it right. Okay, so it's, it's a simple, well, it's a reasonably simple um, equation. The answer that you get is always between zero and one always between those numbers so if by some chance that you get these two mixed up and you do solvent divided by substance you get a value of 1.67 you know it's the other way around because it can only be between zero and one in this equation rf of b is distance moved by substance is three divided by distance moved by solvent is 12 and if we do 3 divided by 12 if I get my calculator out we get 0 0.25 now there are data books that exist here data book and you can have a look at for example um, paint RF values and see what type of blue paint has an RF value of 0 0.25 and it might come out you know royal blue as an RF value of 0 0.25. So you know exactly what paint that is. It's used for identification purposes in forensics. Um, it's used for the police force when they use um, forensic analysis. Those RF values are specific. And it doesn't matter if that solvent front was 12 centimeters or if it was 10 centimeters or eight, the difference between these two values is your RF value. Okay, the ratio between them is always the same. So B will always move a quarter of the distance compared to the solvent front. So if your solvent front was four centimeters tall, B would be expected to move only one centimeter. Does that make sense? You could probably say you could be saying no, but I don't know. Um, so the two things that I want you to do this lesson. The first thing is to try and write out your own um, method. So describe how a student could identify the dyes in her pen ink. Include the equipment the student will use, the method she will carry out, and how she will process the results. Okay, I'll put this answer on the next slide. I'll also upload a PDF version of the PowerPoint if you can't get your uh, PowerPoint to work, if you haven't got Office installed, blah, blah. Um, for one to two marks, you're just having a really simple description. And on the other side, there are 10 points. So if you get between one and three of those points, you get one to two marks, depending on what your spelling grammar is. Um, three to four marks is a description of the apparatus and the method. Um, and you get four to six out of the 10 points. And then a five to six mark answer would be between seven and all of them, seven and 10 points. It's on the other slide. Remember to talk about the setup, the equipment that you need, um, how you're going to use it, how long you're going to leave it for, what to do after you've done it, how to interpret the chromatogram. So that's the how, how she will process the results. Um, just, just write everything in, just that verbal diarrhea of everything that I've just said in this lesson. Okay. The 
second one. In fact, what I'll do, pause the video now if you want to, um, and you can uh, answer the question, and then I'll just click to the next slide as part of this recording. That should be enough time. So let's just quickly have a look at the answers. So for, for one mark, for one point, you're talking about your equipment. So that was that one slide that I drew really badly. The, the beaker, chromatography paper, pencil, water, dye, or substance. You don't have to have dye. Um, oh, no, you do for this, in, this example, don't you? Because she's talking about the dyes in her ink pen. Um, you're drawing a pencil line near the bottom of the paper, paper um, and putting a dot of each dye on. You're making sure that the water or the solvent, you could say solvent, is below the pencil line. Wait for the water or the solvent to travel to the near the top of the paper and measure the distance between the pencil line and the solvent front for your main one. Then measure the distance traveled by each spot of color. Uh, calculate the RF value is one mark in itself. The second mark is actually saying what the equation is. So it's distance traveled by the dye divided by distance traveled by the solvent. So that's a smaller number divided by the bigger number. And then compare the RF value with the other RF values um, you could use a, a data book for that. You could use a data book um, or you could test it with known dyes so you can add known dyes in. Really matter. Um, good. So um, that's the first task that I want you to do for today. The second one, what I'm going to do is I'm going to post a few questions, uh, some exam questions for exam practice. Um, and I'd like you to go through them. If I just very quickly, uh, let's keep the stuff i'll show you the uh, that one there we go thought i'd show you the show you the questions anyway um you know first you're looking at um, errors in setup which is fine so we can notice a few errors there you can see that there's a there's a, a black food coloring and a number of um known substances you can see um, here we've got the results from it. So we have sort of the same lines at the same height. We can identify what the substance is. Um, this one, the mark scheme that I'll put on, is measuring the distance if it were printed out in front of you. But because it's a comparative measurement, you can just measure it on your computer screen using a ruler put in your values and still get the same RF value. So as long as the RF value is correct, you can get the marks for part two and part three, okay? because it's the comparison between the distance the die travels and the distance the solvent front. That could be you know, printed out in A3, could be printed out A5, um, could be on your computer screen, doesn't really matter. The ratio will still be the same. So don't worry about thinking you need to print something. Uh, and here you've got the RF values for a bunch of food colorings, and you need to use the data to identify which you think was um, used in the original experiment. So which was this black food coloring? Um, is it here? Can you identify it or not? You might not be able to. I don't know the RF value, if I'm honest. Um, two types of chromatography, are gas chromatography and paper chromatography give one advantage. So for that question D, what I'd like to do is just research uh, what gas chromatography is compared to paper. Some people, you can probably work it out that paper uses the chromatography paper. Gas is a bit more of a uh, an accurate reading, uh, but I want you to research that. I might try and include, if I can find a BBC Bite Size page to add there for you. Okay. Um, if you have any questions whatsoever about any of this, um, I'd like you to message. Um, I'm always on Show My Homework from Monday to Friday, so you can get in touch. Um, or on Microsoft Teams, you can post a message on there as well. Um, we don't mind. So if you just do that, if not, I'm expecting you to be absolutely fine. There's only one uh, more lesson as part of your, your GCSE course for chemistry. So um, our lesson later on this week will be a quiz that I've already done. I think that's on Thursday. And then next week, you'll just have one final chemistry lesson before we move on to some more practical uses, um, sort of getting you ready for either sixth form or for college or for apprenticeships or whatever you decide to do in the big wide world. Um, we're going to be running sessions on um, sort of uh, skills that you can apply.